helps if I turn this on first. Okay. Yeah. So we have we have David Kennedy. He is the founder of TrustedSec LLC, and he's also the co-founder and CTO of Binary Defense Systems. Dave's had guest appearances on Fox News, CNN, and other high-profile media outlets, such as the Katie Couric Show, <laughs> where he was dubbed the sexiest man alive. I can't disagree. Dave's also the founder of DerbyCon, a large-scale security conference in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm sure many of you have been to it. If you haven't, please do. Uh, Dave also co-authored Metasploit, the penetration tester's guidebook, which was number one on Amazon.com security for over six months. Dave is also one of the founding members of the penetration testing execution standard. Then I also asked for quotes about Dave from some of his friends. Paul.com. Of Security Weekly had a few choice things to say, but I kind of kept it clean for the hour. Dave defined the serious hacking day for me, which I think has something to do with socks and watches. That's Paul, and Dave loves his socks. So Dave is also the creator of the severely, uh, sorry, se of several widely popular open source tools, including the Social Engineers Toolkit and many more. Who's ever used that, the Social Engineers Toolkit? Awesome, that's good to say. But have you ever read the terms and conditions? <laughs> it's kind of important. If you've never read it, it says, also note that by using this software, if you ever see the creator of Set in a bar, you should give him a hug and should buy him a beer and a bourbon. I don't have a beer, but. <laughs> Lastly, Dave was a US Marine. Thank you for your service. Working for the intelligence community. And spent several years in the Middle East, including Iraq. I am proud and honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Dave Kennedy. Wow, how do I, uh, how do I go from there? It's not me. It's not me. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming on a uh, Saturday morning uh, to to come hear me talk and uh, and a lot of other great speakers here today. Hopefully, you uh, get to see a lot of great great talks. Uh, the um, list here is uh, absolutely amazing. But uh, I have to warn you, I lost my voice uh, two days ago. And it came back slightly yesterday, and this morning it got worse, but it actually sounds like it got a little bit better. So we'll play with it and see how it goes. But uh, my son brought home the plague um, and uh, literally destroyed our entire household. So I got back from Hong Kong on Monday. In fact, that Jason Street, who's right there? Hey, Jason. That's Jason Street right there, everybody. Give a round of applause for Jason. <laughs> he hates that. He hates that. That's why I did it. Um, I got back from Hong Kong on Monday, and actually, as I was getting to Hong Kong, Jason was flying away from Hong Kong, um, but my son went on a Cub Scouts thing, and they went to a naval vessel to kind of see uh, the naval vessels. When they got home, everybody that went on the Cub Scout pack was completely deathly sick, including my dad, who took them, um, and then killed our whole household, so that was wonderful. Um, but we were uh, but glad to be here. I'm glad to uh, be in Boston. Uh, go Cavs. So... Uh, I made the mistake. I didn't realize where I was going yesterday or, uh, uh, today, and I uh, wore uh, the, the Cleveland shirt, you know, a big calf shirt. I went down to the bar yesterday to go get a drink, and uh, I literally got stopped by like eight people that weren't happy with me. So um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Good luck. I don't need to go through any of the abouts. Um, but what I'm talking about today is, you know, if you look at, at what we're dealing with um, in information security, there's a lot of different things. I mean, obviously, everybody's been seeing a lot of what's been happening with the whole shadow brokers dump, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I was actually up till 2 o'clock in the morning um, getting a remote code execution working with our own custom payload, so I'll show you how to do that here in just a little bit. Um, but what was interesting and what we see out there is this industry has a lot of things coming at it, um, a lot of different attack vectors, everything from phishing all the way to zero days. Um, and it's really difficult for us in, in companies to get a handle around what we need to do. And a lot of the technology and a lot of defenses that we build are real generic in nature to stop some of the, the most basic of things, but they don't look for a lot of the patterns of behavior that we do as attackers. And as an attacker, um, going into you know, countless organizations, 
Most of the stuff that is built is literally for off the shelf, you know, um, what you can download from the internet. Good example is PowerShell. A lot of people flag on encoded command for a PowerShell flag. There's 12 different iterations of, of encoded command, and you have to call encoded command in order to get PowerShell ex uh, execution. So some of the things that I just see commonly in the industry, some things that I can hopefully help you out with, but also show you some cool hacks um, along the way. And so first, how about, how about them leaks that happen, right? Um, so if you're not familiar with what leaks happened over um, as of yesterday, actually happened last night, um, the leaks should be no surprise. And I'll talk a little bit about what the, what the leaks are here in just a second. But the leaks should be no surprise. They uh, contain a mixture of zero days as well as already patched vulnerabilities um, that are out there. Um, but what was interesting to see is that, you know, a lot of these countries, including ourselves, have capabilities of zero days, as we've been saying for years and years and years and years. So there's no real surprise on what our capabilities are, um, who they are, and what they're doing. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that we just didn't expect a large leak like this all at once, where now we have a whole stash of code that we have to go through. And, and a lot of it's actually executable, so we have to disassemble and reverse engineer how it's working, do packet, packet dumps. There's already a lot of research going into that. In fact, uh, uh, as of like five minutes ago, I think we just got um, the, our Python prototype done for the latest, uh, it's uh, MS1710, uh, uh, which is remote code execution and SMB version one for all versions of Windows. Um, so that's a fantastic one. It's MS0867 on steroids. Uh, I'm sorry, I think it's, it's Windows uh, 8.1, but it also can be ported to Windows 10, which is fantastic. So it's, it's the next MS0867, so we can all celebrate for like the next nine years. So. <laughs> We can have birthday cakes and everything else made for MS10. I, I wish, it, wouldn't it have been amazing, like the world's aligning if it had been MS17067? I mean, it would just would have been, I, I would have, I would have just, I could have died happy. So, um, but if you're not familiar with what's happening, you know, um, the shadow brokers is loosely attributed or attributed to Russia, okay? Um, the equation group has been loosely attributed to the NSA. Kaspersky was uh, one of the first ones, but, you know, have tied it back to Stuxnet and a lot of the other components where we've kind of be, become public in a lot of our offensive capabilities. And so what's been happening lately is that, um, and what the shadow brokers claim, um, which seems to align up, is that the equation group, i.e. the NSA, was conducting um, operations abroad, um, including compromising a large percentage of the SWIFT network um, for the banking transactions and the financial backbones to monitor transactions, um, intelligence gaining purposes, uh, things like that. And what Russia did is they identified where um, the equation group was coming from. And by the way, I'm not gonna talk about anything classified, so if you're in the military, don't worry, I'm not gonna start saying any TSSEI stuff, then you have to leave the room. Um, so so I'll, I'll make sure not to quote any classified information that's been leaked because you still are um, subject to that. But uh, what the shadow brokers ended up doing um, is tracing back the infrastructure that the NSA was using to conduct operations um, abroad. And so they actually hacked the infrastructure that the NSA was using um, and, and stole a large percentage of their tools. Um, so we saw a couple weeks ago that the shadow broker dump um, was actually released. They had put, put it up on, on, uh, on the dark web for auction for a significant amount of money. I think it was like, like $50 million or something crazy. And then literally as soon as we bombed Syria, um, the, you know, lo and behold, the, the first dump was released, which contained a lot of remote exploits for Linux-based systems. Um, then we saw just yesterday where they released a large cache of Windows exploits. Um, everything ranging from IIS 6 exploits um, all the way to um, you know, SMB exploits and everything else. There's also a really cool um, exploitation framework, uh, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, that the NSA also got leaked. Um, it's basically the Metasploit for the NSA, which is now getting forked and now developed now, so it's gonna be like the next you know, Python-based Metasploit, which is gonna be fantastic. I'm just curious, uh, what's the licensing for using NSA's code? Can you fork it and like, do like a BSD license? How does that work? You know, I guess it's taxpayer dollars, and typically you know, like the government has no copyright over their material, so technically we should be able to use it, right? So um, there's a lot of great stuff that was actually released um, inside of it. Um, but it just shows you um, what's actually happening right now is, is a lot of, of information warfare around you know, different governments hacking each other, exposing other data, and based on, on foreign policy, releasing a lot of this data um, that's out there. So it's kind of a, a scary time when you actually look at it. And so let's just say hypothetically the shadow brokers are Russia and that the equation group is the NSA. There's some serious stuff going on right now between the two countries, uh, between us and, and, and Russia. Obviously, um, escalation criteria, Trump has said that you know, it's probably the worst relations that we've had. Same thing for Putin. Um, we're launching offensives in Syria. We're going after North Korea. Key allies of those. Iran is against us. So there's a lot of uh, foreign policy things that are happening around this time, and, and the releases coincide with a lot of what's actually happening out there um, in the industry. Now, the scary part about a lot of this is, um, you know, if you look at what uh, Russia leaked as far as the exploits, that means that Russia either has had already been using those exploits for a large period of time, because the dump goes back to about 2013. So these exploits have been compromised since 2013. 
They've been known to be compromised since 2013. We've never published anything around that to say, hey, you know, these exploits are out in the wild. Microsoft, you should go and fix these. Linux, you should go and fix these things. There hasn't been any release to actually go and do it. Um, now, a lot of these have actually been fixed, luckily, um, just through um, normal disclosure, like Google's uh, uh, zero, day, uh, zero Project has actually gone through and fixed a lot of these and found these bugs ahead of time that were actively being used. But that means that Russia probably has the same capabilities, if not better, to launch offensives against us um, and didn't care if we burned these specific sources on it. Now, one thing I want to say is, I, I, you know, I, I, um, it's not a good day for our intelligence community when you leak a large amount of this data, um, especially exploitation frameworks, direct exploits that we use for offensives, implants. A large percentage of what was leaked was still what we would consider today as being um, very significant around, you know, hey, we fish first, we get access to an infrastructure, and then we need to do lateral movement to move to other systems, and how do we do that lateral movement? Well, hey, we have a whole bunch of zero days and implants that we can use to get access to different systems. So, you know, it's a bad day for the intelligence community because they lo lost a large percentage in cash around what they do as far as weaponization of their stuff. So it's not a good day for the intelligence community, and it shouldn't be a good day for the United States. We shouldn't be bragging like, hey, you know, hey, we got all these great exploits, that's fantastic. Well, yeah, as a security researcher, it's great to, to be able to say, okay, yeah, you know, the zero-day angle is still a very big play in what we're seeing today, um, but at the same time, we should be pretty alarmed at what's been happening around these, the, the leaking of a lot of this data. So I want to say a special thanks uh, to everybody that made the exploits possible. Um, you know, it, it's, you know I, to me personally, and this is, you know, you, you maybe um, have different various of views, but I believe that we need to have these types of exploits and capabilities um, for our military. It's extremely important. Our adversaries have the same type of capabilities. They're using the same things against us, so in order for us to be able to go on the offense as well, we need the same type. But at that same time, with great power comes the great responsibility effort, right? A big Spider-Man fan, right? So with that, I mean, you can learn everything you can in life based on Spider-Man, um, including how to be cool in a uniform and tights and stuff like that. I, I, I try that, it doesn't work very well, but, um, but what we learn from that is, you know, the, the government does have a responsibility that once an exploit has been burned, to work with you know, the, the different parties like Microsoft and, and Cisco and Linux to actually address those exposures because they are actively being used. That wasn't done here. In 2013, it was, it was compromised. The infrastructure was known burned, and they didn't contact anybody to notify them that something had actually been compromised. That's a problem. So we have no responsible disclosure method when it comes to developing these weapons, and then when we're conducting operations or offensives, to have them actively go and fixed afterwards. So what this leak tells us is, you know, the information warfare campaign is not dying down. Um, it's legit, and there's a lot of, of power um, against this. I mean, there's a lot of people developing significant, substantial amounts of efforts. I mean, like literally what the shadow brokers leaked was probably a couple mil worth of exploits. A couple million dollars, they just like literally lit on fire and, and you know, didn't care about what was actually happening because of, of how we're actively going and doing things. And so you're looking at a time now where we're literally having the best military doesn't mean anything right now. You know, we, have, we are a, a direct peer competitive um, uh, playing field when it comes to who we're going after. Iran is probably a couple years behind us, but Russia and China are very close to what we're doing, if not better. So we have a problem now where, you know, military capability wise, having the best military, the most amount of bombs, the most amount of, you know, advanced military doesn't mean squat when it comes to what we could do offensively. So here's a video that I did two years ago uh, when I was on by the way, it is Fox News, sorry. I should have put a CNN one here as well. I try to balance all my series. Um, I don't care which one I'm on. I try to do them all. I think all politics suck, so I don't even follow anything. So, um, But this is one thing where two years ago, this is General Dempsey. And, and if you don't know, the military has been, and especially the NSA director, um, everybody else has been very open about what our capabilities are and where our shortfalls are. And they're not joking around with what we're talking about. It's not a way to scare us into giving away privacy and stuff like that. Which, by the way, you know, I got in a huge argument on Fox and I, um, on Judge Janine where I, I got three people yelling at me that I was wrong about giving the FBI the back door to an iPhone would be, you know, kind of like the downfall. If, if we can't protect our most awesome weapons, how is the FBI going to protect having access to every iPhone? So anyway, so it's all coming to fruition, which is great. But this is back in 2015 and General Dempsey um, was talking about our, our cyber capabilities and what that actually means. It can be incredibly destructive. It can be disruptive. It can disrupt and it can destroy. And it can destroy hardware, it can, it can, uh, it can disable <laughs> critical infrastructure, which could lead to loss of life. Uh, and I think those capabilities are out there. And, you know, we have, in every domain, Chris, we generally uh, 
uh, enjoy a significant military advantage. But we have peer competitors in cyber. In other words, we don't have an advantage over that. We, we don't have an advantage. It's a level playing field, and that makes this chairman very uncomfortable. So why are we not ready? How devastating could this be? And is this just beginning? Tech expert David Penny joins us. David, um, should uh, is this the tip of the iceberg? Is this a warning? Or is it I'm not wearing pants in this. I'm serious. <laughs> I have, uh, I have uh, uh, gym shorts on. It's my, my MO. I do the Charles Barkley, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, Charles Barkley, when he's on, he has like a suit and tie on and uh, doesn't typically uh, wear pants. So I do the same thing. It's just no big deal. I think it's the tip of the iceberg, Greta, and it's not really a think. We've been actually been warning about this for a number of years in the security industry. You've had some big players like Russia and China where they've hacked into us for more military preparedness. <coughs> and that was, so that was two years ago. So, you know, we know that this is a problem with what we're dealing with today. Now, if, if shadow brokers are responding to world events and burning reliable exploits, again, it means that they already have things that are comparable or better than, than what they released um, out there. So, it's good to understand you know, what our adversaries are. And there hasn't been a large leak of Russian exploits or Chinese exploits. We know a lot of what they do from an infrastructure perspective, like China likes using plug acts, Russia likes using PowerShell and WMI persistence. Um, but we don't know their exploitation techniques or how good their A teams or tier one and tier two teams um, actually are yet at this point, at least not in our, our field. So um, if you look at the leaks, what was actually captured? Now this is a, a screenshot from uh, Campus Cody. And so, Here's a list of, of all the different things that were released in this last dump here yesterday. And so we have everything from, you know, uh, um, uh, M. Damon email server vulnerability to Lotus Notes exploits um, to IES 6 exploits, um, a reliable 2000, RDP 2003 um, exploit. And what's nice about it is that if you had a EULA or a, a license agreement, it even clicked through for you and hit OK and then exploit the machine, which is great. So it's accepting the licensing agreement, which is fantastic, <clears throat> that you won't hack unauthorized or any way, shape, or form. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a number of SMB exploits um, targeting everything from Windows XP service back, uh, or Windows XP, uh, fully patched. No patches obviously can be released um, past this point, all the way to uh, Server 2012. So a large range of, of different exploits that are out there uh, currently, everything affecting ver uh, SMB version 1 and SMB version 2. Now, I know um, the guy that wrote uh, Responder uh, was talking yesterday about um, the specific vulnerability in SMB version 1. There was a project apparently back in 1996 or so called Cairo um, which was integrated into SMB version 1, but it never got fully um, implemented. That's where a lot of these bugs have been uh, found as of late, um, is in the Cairo project, which was actually never fully implemented, but is in actual every version of, of SMB version 1 that's out there. So a lot of good exploits um, that are coming from this one specifically um, that's out there. Now, good news is a lot of these have already been addressed. You know, as um, security researchers go through these protocols um, and they find things, um, you know, they, they're obviously uh, proof of concepts, denial of services, and may not be um, actively weaponized. Microsoft's actually fixed a lot of these. The, the big one, uh, which was uh, Eternal Blue, um, which, is, which is the new MS-0867, uh, which is MS-17010, got fixed on Tuesday. Tuesday. So it's been actively exploited since 2013 by Russia and other adversaries. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist here, but in 2013, you know, it, all the information around the SWIFT uh, uh, banking network got hacked by Russia, okay? And then in 2015 and 2016, all of the SWIFT infrastructure got hacked and a whole bunch of money got sent out. That seems kind of suspicious or coincidental, right? And it's loosely attributed back to North Korea at that point. So it's all weird how this is all kind of playing together um, in this specific dump or leak. Um, but Eternal Blue is really the, the, the most awesomest one. They had their own MSO867, so they knew about MSO867 well before it was ever publicly released out there. Um, so a lot of great capabilities that you can see kind of uh, coming from the NSA. Um, what was nice about, um, and by the way, <clears throat> I got to give the NSA a, a round of applause for their ASCII art. It is. <laughs> That's some legit hackers, okay? When you got ASCII art and you got like beer mugs and you know, you got a bunch of other things, they're legit on, on what they're doing as far as hackers. So every good hacker has to have uh, uh, ASCII art or it's not, not legit. Um, but if you look at Eternal Romance, uh, what would happen, and, and the way that the, um, the framework would work, and I'll talk a little bit about um, fuzz here in a second, FP, is um, you would compromise a system, and then you would use um, their, their exploitation framework as a pivot point. And what um, Eternal Romance would do is it would profile the target system looking for vulnerabilities, and it would say, hey, this, this specific system is vulnerable to six exploits. Do you want to deploy these? And it would go in, and run an exploit, and then it would hit an implant, and then it would you know, call back to the command and control infrastructure for the NSA, and then have full access to everything. 
Um, so a lot of really cool stuff um, being built and you know, very similar to what we would use in the private sector. So good attestation around what we're doing in the industry. So just when we thought MS-8067 was killed, um, we got this bigger brother who's 900 pounds and carries guns riding a flaming unicorn and breathes fire. Um, <clears throat> so what was nice about um, this one specifically is it targets all versions of Windows. Um, so it's fantastic for us, and it will last for the next nine years because we are still absolutely terrible with patch management. We just got rid of like MS-8067 like last month. Like literally people just started patching and finally got rid of that last, you know, legacy server that they finally went through hell in a handbasket through change control and like $7 million to remediate a old version that they couldn't get their ERP system upgraded to, and finally got rid of that last MS-0267 only to have this one pop up. So we'll be good for like the next nine years as pen testers. <clears throat> so you look at it, multiple zero days. Um, a lot of them, again, have been addressed. Um, but we finally have multiple Windows XP and Server 2003 ones, which there's still plenty of them out there. Um, someone did a showdown query on, on who has Microsoft Windows out there um, uh, with 445 or 135 open. You know, something like 2,300,000 different IPs still had uh, NetBIOS and RPC exposed on the outside. Like 590,000 were in the United States. I'm like, seriously, what is wrong with us? <clears throat> so last night, I didn't go to bed till like 2 a.m. Um, because we were working on trying to get um, a stable payload uh, through the framework in order to get something like Cobalt Strike or Metasploit um, directly into it. And so um, it was just recently patched on Tuesday, but MS-1710, um, does work. We got it to fully work on a Windows 7, uh, fully patched minus the patch of, of, off of Tuesday. And so here's an example of using uh, Fuzzbunch. So Fuzzbunch, by the way, is the, the, the met, um, is a framework, and I'll actually blow this up a little bit. In fact, I'll actually just go to full screen on this one real quick. Hang on. Let me just up this a little bit, move this over. So this is Fuzzbunch, <clears throat> and what you need to do in Windows is just basically install uh, Py132, Python, um, and you're all set. And you just run fb.py, um, which is um, Fuzzbunch, which is the exploitation framework that's very similar to Metasploit. Um, have, has a lot of different similarities. You can type things like help, use, um, use different payloads. You know, it's very similar um, to, to everything else out there. Now, we're, in here, we're going to be using um, the specific exploit, uh, the MS1710. Uh, uh, we enter our IP address in, where we want to put our, our logs at and any specific project that we're working on, a specific campaign to target somebody. So we'll just call this demo one. Now you can see it even has tab completion, which is fantastic. <laughs> and so we're gonna use eternal blue, which is the, the exploit that we're gonna actually go and target. We're gonna send the target IP address, which is what we've already predefined. Um, we're gonna verify the backdoor is actually implanted. And we can target the different uh, specific systems. And which payload we want to use. It has the two built-in ones. And then we'll go ahead and execute it. <clears throat> it goes and triggers the overflow. Um, uses a uh, uh, egg hunter, which is a way of searching for um, your shell code somewhere in the memory. So it's probably a memory corruption flaw. Once it triggers, our back door's installed. Now we have access to the computer. Now this is using their implant, right? Um, so this is something that, that we wouldn't necessarily be able to leverage yet. So what we did is we earned second video. Let me blow this up again. This is using our own custom payload. Uh, in this case, we're using a uh, um, obfuscated uh, cobalt strike payload. But you can use Materp or anything else. Uh, we just use the DLL, uh, but it supports shell code. And so over here, we're going to go ahead and use the exploit again. So eternal blue. Again, the IP address. I'm going to specify our target, just like the same steps as we did before. And once we get into our exploit itself, before we execute, we actually import our DLL, and then we run artifacts.dll. And we get access to Cobalt Strike. Notice down at the bottom, our Cobalt Strike payload's been imported. And we'll see a beacon here in just a second. So 
So we have to specify our, our DLL that we're going to inject. The way that we use this is what we call double pulsar. It's a way of deploying our own payload. They had cool names. So set function run DLL. We have our artifact at DLL, which is what we're going to be using. Sorry for the delay. We were literally at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to type all this. So we set the DLL ordinal, uh, ordinal to 5. And then we actually set the DLL payload, which is execute, to the actual path. And then we execute it. Now, once we execute, it takes a second. We'll see our beacon hit back in just a second. Execute plugin, yes. And we get our beacon. Pretty awesome stuff. Free exploits. So if you want a full write-up. If you want a full write-up in a step-by-step, -step, it's up there. It also has analysis on all the different exploits, um, what was contained in the dump files, um, analysis of all the different structures, payloads, um, everything that's out there, um, all up on that site. Um, plus, we'll be continuing on more and more with analysis. We're actually disassembling the executables because the actual source code for these, um, for fp.py and stuff like that, that was all, the framework is all um, open source, but the actual exploits were in executables. So we have to disassemble and do packet captures to figure out what's actually triggering those and then the exploits themselves. So we're currently underway for the prototypes of that. So we should hopefully have those done uh, within the next day or so uh, for a lot of the exploits out there. But if you look at, at what the tactics, techniques, and, and, and procedures, what we call TTPs are um, of this, you know, it's nice to look at what's happening with the NSA, what's happening with Russia, what's happening with China, what's happening with organized crime and ransomware and everything else that we see out there. Because as, as assessors and pen testers, we're supposed to be simulating what's happening in the real world. We're supposed to be doing things that, that are very similar to what our risks and threats are going to be in this landscape, in this, or, um, in this community, in order to build better defenses. And so looking at something of what the NSA's capabilities are, the equation of group's capabilities are, is very beneficial for us to get an understanding around the zero-day angles, because a lot of what we hear today is just, hey, it's just phishing, it's just phishing, it's just phishing. No, we still have zero-days out there. There's still a lot of them out there. It's just gone underground because they're very expensive to develop nowadays. And so what is the information that we've actually learned from, from this, um, and what can we learn from this specific dump or all the other dumps that have been happening out there? So the, the first thing is, is understanding that users are still by far the number one most attack surface out there today. That's not changing. You know, if you look at, at a lot of what the tools were for the NSA and the equation group, um, it was specifically designed for lateral movement. It was designed to compromise a host and go to the next one until they get access to the objective data that they needed to or the intelligence gaining purposes are for collection. So what we learned too is, is what the NSA does is not magic, right? What the CIA is doing is not magic. What Russia is doing is not magic. There's no magic out there. You know, we have a lot of money. We spend millions of dollars with third-party contractors, with exploit researchers to build these and then weaponize them that we can use for intelligence purposes. We conduct operations. Same thing that Russia does. Same thing that everybody else does. Um, it's just not, you know, it's just more public now in nature because we're seeing a lot of this information leaked. So that's, uh, the top right is, is what you see from the, the JAR file. Now, by the way, that's, the, that's probably the best well-made graphic I've ever seen um, come from the government. It probably costs like $7 million of taxpayer money. <laughs> um, so I'm going to use the heck out of it um, because I know I paid for that, 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 uh, for that uh, diagram. But, you know, from what we can see, um, you know, from, from a lot of what happened from Grizzly Step and all the whole DNC hacking stuff, which is all now in question, by the way. I don't know if you saw what happened, but I guess CrowdStrike uh, retracted their statement that it was... Russia because they didn't actually do a lot of the analysis and they didn't get a lot of access to the servers and stuff. So they actually recanted a lot of that. So who knows what's going on with that. But what we're seeing um, is a lot of, a lot of massive resources um, stepped at going and targeting specific infrastructure. And what the other thing, um, what was interesting about the um, CIA leaks is not necessarily code, which by the way, huge fan. If, um, if, if anybody here or listening is, is part of the CIA, 
You guys look like you have a ton of fun. I mean, like the, the CIA playbooks and everything, the, the programs that they had were huge Doctor Who fans, so you're near and dear to my heart. Uh, the Weeping Angel program, the Sonic Screwdriver program, those are all sweet things that I thought was really cool. Um, but the, the codes and techniques that were used by the CIA wasn't necessarily the most interesting piece. The most damaging was the CIA playbooks. The playbooks actually talked about how they conduct um, operations, how they do espionage, how they do all that. Like, and that's very hard to change um, tactics and shift tactics based off of that information being leaked. So here's a, a, a thing that I did on, on Fox. Um, again, it is Fox again, son of a, I need to. <laughs> if I knew Jason was here, I would have switched him out. But let me, because uh, it's getting cut off a little bit, I'm going to move it down here a little bit. Here's what I did on Fox talking about um, the CIA playbook, and then most specifically, um, why it's important for us to have these capabilities in general, and hopefully not get them leaked. It's been 48 hours since close to 9,000 pages from the CIA cyber spying playbook revealed all kinds of holes in our laptops and smartphones. The documents flooded the internet, silence until today, when that guy, the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, surfaced saying he's the one who put it all out there and that the CIA has lost control of its entire weapons arsenal. But then there's this. Assange now says he plans on helping the tech companies protect their devices. Listen. Hearing these calls from um, some of the manufacturers, uh, we have decided to uh, work with them uh, to give them some exclusive access uh, to the additional technical details we have. So, by the way, do anybody know what the stipulation was in order to get access to the files? Is you had to promise and sign legal documents to never, ever work with the government ever again. Okay. Uh, so that fixes uh, can be developed uh, and pushed out so people can be secured. Hmm. How sweet of him. Is Assange suddenly becoming an angel of assistance by offering to do what some say the CIA should have done from the start, and that's warn companies about their own vulnerabilities? Let's bring in two white hat hackers. They get picked. By the way, same outfit, by the way, huh? Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> To expose lapses in security at firms across the country. Hacker Still no bands, yes, yeah, right. And CTO Alex Rice and trusted, S trusted sex founder and CEO David Kennedy. Welcome to. I mean. I'm glad I named my company Trusted Sec because news anchor people have the worst time pronouncing it because they don't want to say trusted. So, so they, they always either abbreviate it, say trusted SEC, or they're like trusted, trusted, trusted sec, uh, you know, so every time, every time you look at all my news interviews, it's like trusted sec, sex, sex, security <laughs> advisor, every time, never fails. And, and they'll even ask me beforehand, they're like, hey, how do you pronounce your company? I'm like, it's trusted sec. Okay, got it, got it, got it, and they still stumble, it's great. Of you. Um, Alex, I'll begin with you. And before we get to whether the CIA should have notified these companies, is Julian Assange bluffing or is he to be trusted? These tech companies are defending against attacks every day, and it's a, a battle that most of them have been losing. And so they need every advantage they can get. They, they absolutely should receive and, and analyze this information, independently verify all of it. <laughs> it is a a, a positive step, no matter what the motivations behind WikiLeaks might be. But David, Assange is saying that, that he is willing to, to extend a hand and help them. Uh, boy, is, is that uh, the devil in angel's clothes? I'm just wondering. Well, we've seen previous WikiLeaks before where that hasn't been the case, where they've exposed a lot of data that were, was very damaging. And there's, there's two components to what was released. There's the, the documents and the playbooks, but there's also code and techniques that the CIA actively use in order to go after different government agencies. Now, seriously, where do they get these names from? It's amazing. Wrecking Crew, Crunchy Lime Skies, Elder Piggy, Anger Quake, McNugget, McNugget, I can understand, but I mean. <laughs> really damaging uh, both to the intelligence operations that we perform abroad, as well as puts you know, the uh, United States in harm's way um, against adversaries that, is, you know, that we're actively doing campaigns against, mm -hmm. um, against these. So we have to have these trades of, of craft. We, ha we, we should definitely be hoarding these exploits and keeping them. Um, for going act after these um, different countries for what the th types of technology that they're using because the same thing's happening to us. Russia, China, they all have the same. 
I won't go through all the specifics, and that was like kind of a long segment, but what was interesting in that, and, and you can be on either side, and, and for, there's a lot of arguments to be made for all sides of this, of hey, we, the government should give all of the security exposure so that we get better on defense, and that's a, that's a, that's a very plausible um, way as well. You know, I, I personally believe that we should keep them because everybody else has them as well, and then when we, when we actually burn them and, and it gets noticed, we should fix those issues. But if you look at a life cycle of an attack, and what we're seeing, Everybody's doing the exact same thing, regardless if you're the CIA, the FBI, a hacker, a pen tester, or anybody else. We all follow very much the same consistent format about how we target um, our, our, our organizations. First thing we do is we define who we're going to hack, right? Are we going to go after a company? We're going to go after individual people. Um, what are we going to actively go and do? We build or buy our tools. In the NSA's case, or the equation group, they, a lot of them are bought from the, you know, um, the exploit market or third-party contractors, or they may have um, people in-house doing them, um, or build your own tools. Uh, build an attack profile, maybe test for some detection um, via some phishing to understand what organization you're targeting for. And then from there, um, the deployment of the infrastructure that we're going to actively go and use, and then the initial intrusion. Now, in the security industry, we have all of our eggs in one basket right now around that one component, that initial intrusion. So if our endpoint agents don't detect something, and all of a sudden now an attacker is sitting on our system, it becomes much more difficult for us to detect the patterns of behavior about moving to different systems, such as lateral movement and everything else. That's why we designed these things called SIMs, because they'd be all this aggregator of data that we can then use all this information so that we could you know, hopefully find you know, weird abnormal patterns in our environment. But what we found is that there's so much data, we have no idea what to do with it. It's like literally, all we look for now is if someone added a domain admin to the, the domain admins group. And that's our, that's our SIM use cases that we spent $5 million on, right? Fantastic, right? That's a good return on investment. You know, once, once we don't detect the persistence hooks, and maybe I'm using PowerShell injection, or I'm using a way of getting around um, application whitelisting. There's a lot of techniques around application whitelisting. PowerShell's a great version. Reg SVR32 is also another great one. It has a built-in browser to it, which is awesome. Um, so these are all different techniques that you can use to get around things like application whitelisting or traditional techniques. Um, you know, once I do lateral movement, try to find uh, what I need, get my, get my information, and then move out. Maybe hold persistence if I want to, um, to stay in, in the facility to get more information. But one thing's for certain, humans still continue to be the largest exposure that we have. Like, you know, 99% of the issues that we have today still come to the users. And so if you, you make something, anything, believable, like literally, you could like call the salesperson and be like, hey, I'm going to give you a million dollars because I need to spend it by Friday, but I need to infect your system with soft, malicious software. Can you open up this executable that says malware.exe? The sales guy's going to be like, well, am I still going to get the million dollars? <laughs> well, yeah, okay. As long as it's believable, we're good, right? So, you know, certain scenarios and situations um, make things extremely easy for us because people are, are trustworthy and in their positions, we're designed to trust and culturally we're designed to trust. And so when we were talking about building security programs, we have to build a program that is built off of abnormal behavior, things that aren't normal in our environment. So the times of the perimeter, like we have no perimeter whatsoever anymore, right? We decided to move to the cloud and all BYODs and everything else that we're, we're doing out there. We become less and less um, uh, toned to more uh, restrictions. A good example is we decided to get next gen with, with uh, next generation firewalls, right? So uh, we all have next generation firewalls now. We're next generation, right? It, all, it stopped all the hacking, right? Now let me ask, when you, when you went with that next-gen solution, okay, so let's just say you're a Cisco shop, right? And, and you have, you know, all these awesome old-school Cisco guys that are all command-line dudes, and they're like, you know, like they're rocking out, and like you don't talk to them because they're like, you know, deep into to their crazy network voodoo stuff that they do on Cisco. And you're like, hey, we're going to go with Palo Alto because like they're next generation, right? And you have all these dudes that have like, you know, 10 years of Cisco experience, and you're like, hey, we're going to switch you to a brand new technology, you have no idea what it does, and it's all gooey, and it's going to be great, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna redesign our network architecture, do network segmentation, define roles and responsibilities, and actually re-architect our solution so that we no longer have like this wide open network, right? Or are we gonna use the Cisco importer tool to Palo Alto and take those 10 years of, <laughs> but now we're next gen. Fantastic. So a lot of things that we do don't make sense in the industry, but hey, that's fine. We have the tools that we already have in our environments, they work, we just have to think a little bit differently on how we protect our infrastructure. A good example is when we move to the cloud, you know, we need to either A, have the same type of detection capabilities or prevention capabilities, or better, right? That would be my criteria to reduce risk or to have the same level of risk that I've already looked at when moving to a new infrastructure. Now, a good example is, is um, uh, Office 365. I got in a little bit of a, a tiff uh, with somebody on Twitter recently, one of the employees of Microsoft. Long story, I'm not going to go into it. Um, 
He's, if all, it's all good. We're all happy now. We're all friends. We pat each other on the back. Um, but what it caused me to do is do analysis around Office 365 and its protection mechanisms. Now, Office 365 has a product called ATP, Advanced Threat Protection. Everybody familiar with that? Advanced Threat Protection has two components. You have safe attachments and you have safe links. Now, safe attachments is supposed to be a, a competitor to Palo Alto's Wildfire or uh, uh, FireEye or things else. What's interesting about that is if you send an email, it takes 15 minutes of analysis. So that means if someone sends you an attachment, you have to wait 15 minutes. Does that work for anybody in business? <laughs> Can you imagine, like, hey, we're going to put in this, we're going to go to Office 365, you have to wait 15 minutes to get your attachment. Okay, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's fine. Anyways, so I started doing analysis around, hey, if I'm going to Office 365, am I going to get the same or better than I could have on-prem? And so what I started looking at was safe links at first. Now, what's interesting about safe links is they tout dynamic uh, inspection of content, all this other stuff, right? Now, what they do is they, when you get an, a link sent to you in an email, it rewrites the link and makes it a safe links. So when you hover over the link, it says safe links. Now, why is that a problem? What do we tell our users to do? Hover over that link, right? No longer going to do that anymore. You have to trust Microsoft. Now, what I started doing is saying, okay, well, what does Microsoft trigger? Maybe it has some amazing protections, and I can trust that my users can just click whatever they want to, right? What I found out is they aren't doing anything. They, they have a, basically a static blacklist of sites that they know are, are compromised sites that they do a comparison to. I ran MS14078, which is an IE memory corruption flaw that it gets picked up by every single antivirus vendor out there, got right through and executed code and crashed my browser. I used HTA files that were not obfuscated doing PowerShell injection, got right past that. I'm like, okay, well, let me just try like random malware. Like, I'm gonna use sub seven from like the 90s. Got right past that, no problem. Download and execute it from it's no problem. So it doesn't do anything. Safe attachment, same thing. If it, does, if it gets past Windows Defender, you're okay. So you can, um, it does do a little bit on, on macro, so don't use auto open, just use on click. So when someone clicks it, it just compromises them anyway. No big deal, all good. So we have to think about things a little bit differently. Um, and I'm a huge advocate, as is a number of us in the industry, um, like Matthew Graber, who's a fantastic resource. He now works at Microsoft, so they're gonna be doing fantastic things, by the way. And that, this isn't a rip on Microsoft in any way. I think it's very difficult to put you know, things in the cloud and scale to the size that Microsoft has to deal with. So they will get better. Uh, and, and with the team that they have, and Matthew and everybody else, and Lee Holmes, and you know, just uh, Jeff Snover, the, the creator of PowerShell, the father of PowerShell, they have some brilliant, brilliant people there, so they will get better, but right now, I. Not, not confident. Um, but the concept of known good is saying, okay, what's my baseline in my environment and how do I make it better? Um, how do I look for deviations of behavior in my environment that are abnormal? And so you've seen certain concepts of this come out, like purple teaming and hunt teaming, looking for things that are outside of our traditional monitoring detection programs of, hey, there's an alarm, let's go investigate that alarm. There are things that we need to do outside of that to make it a little bit better. The first thing of, of known good is, is baselining. I'm a huge advocate of application whitelisting. Everybody cringes when I say that, but you need to do it. You need to say, hey, application whitelisting, by the way, has gotten a lot easier. Like, if you could just say, hey, I'm gonna block all non-code non signing um, executables in my environment, only put exceptions in for what I know, you literally reduce like 90% of your, your noise out there, like 90% of the malware infections, 90% of the ran ransomware. You, know, you literally get 90% of your noise gone by a really easy uh, uh, tick. And if your vendors aren't code signing, you need to boot them the hell out of your company because that's not right. So don't allow any non-code signed service. By the way, you can do that by default in Device Garden in Windows 10. You have the, the, the technology right now to do it right now. So baselining your environment on known, on known good and, and what your environment is and baselining your configurations is one thing that you can do to make it substantially easier right today to make it harder for, for attackers. The second thing is monitoring. Monitor for deviations. There are ways of circumventing application whitelisting. Monitor off of those. Why is notepad.exe contacting off to China? That's straight up not legit, right? By the way, Equation Group likes using Minesweeper. So why is Minesweeper beaconing out to an infrastructure in the United States? That's strange and that legit. You know, you're probably a target of the NSA, right? So Minesweeper's also one. They're like too cool for Notepad. Um, and then what you figure out is, is when I start to monitor those deviations, what can we do to help after that? So then you start getting into some of the cool stuff. How do I look for lateral movement? Lateral movement is very easy to spot. Why is one user maintain, um, and you can do this in your sims, by the way. Um, look for network login type three which is remote logins, look for a key length of zero, which means that they're using a lower level protocol such as SMB version one, and maintain record active sessions around who's logging into what systems based on those two criteria. And you can see where people are logging into. Why is Jane in sales now logging into Bob and IT? That's not legitimate, that's weird behavior. Why is this service account now spraying across the network in our environment? That's lateral movement. Those are things that you can predict patterns on. Deception techniques. 
putting in fake things in your environment, such as fake credentials, um, spraying multicast across your network, giving things for attackers like, hey, make a domain admin account that is like the most god of all domain admins. Make them enterprise admin. I mean, make 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 that 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 domain admin account look like the sexiest thing ever, right? I mean, it's like the super god of your your entire uh, infrastructure. Give it a super long password, and then use something like Honey Tokens and spray that password across the board and, and wait for someone to log in with that account. Now, put a fake password in there. You don't want them logging into your infrastructure. That'd be bad. But you know, when you see a failed login attempt for that one user account, that's a sure sign indicator that something's wrong. Um, looking up for suspicious behavior, um, you know, PowerShell injection, device cards, so much more. Um, if, you're familiar, if you want to look up the, up the Honey Tokens, on one of our guys at Trusted Sec, Ben 10, uh, if you go to github.com slash ben0xa, he created a Honey Tokens uh, PowerShell script that you can run as a scheduled task that creates deception uh, tokens across your network as well as does multicast. So you can send fake LLM and R uh, usernames and passwords across the network, and if you see that username with a failed login attempt, there's a good chance that someone's using Invey or Responder on your infrastructure. Pass to hash detection, very easy to detect on. Event log 4624, login type 3, remote login, key length 0, which means that it's using a lower level protocol, and the account name NTLM SSP. Now, there might be some false positives, things like Nessus, um, other um, uh, services, uh, scanners can use um, lower level protocols to authenticate with. Um, but you, you, uh, you whitelist those and, and look for deviations of pattern off of those. So another great one. Suspicious processes. These are some processes that you can use to get remote code execution to bypass um, application whitelisting. Uh, Tracker.exe, run DLL32, MS build. If you see MS build calling out to a UNC path, that's probably not a good, uh, good thing. Um, RegSVR32, CBD.exe, um, as well as uh, many, many more that's out there. Monitoring for specific registry changes. Um, everybody familiar with the sticky keys um, thing that you can do? Uh, this like it's like old school, right? Like you know, back in the day we used to like you know reboot and like Kali and then rename like you know or, or backtrack or Wapix and IRAX before that. Um, we used to like take you know command.exe and then rename it to setht.exe, which is sticky keys. And then you reboot the computer, and you hit the shift key five times, and it po pop up a command prompt running a system. Now you get a reboot during that period of time. Well, with this registry key, you don't have to reboot. You can actually set um, a specific window, uh, Windows protected process in debug mode and give it a, another spe uh, specific executable. And so you can actually backdoor um, and use sticky keys um, in environments. Now, what's interesting is the past five pen tests that I've been on, past five, I have found sticky keys on all five machines. Developers, love those guys. They forget their passwords all the time. Guys and gals, by the way. Um, they forget their passwords all the time, and they'll use sticky keys and forget to change it back afterwards. So I'd recommend going through your environment looking for sticky keys because they're always out there for some reason. I don't know why. Um, detecting non-PowerShell stuff. Uh, MPS is another thing from, from Ben. You can do things like uh, uh, inject PowerShell without ever using PowerShell itself. Now you can detect that. If you, you see um, uh, system.management.automation.dll running from not PowerShell.exe and not PowerShell underscore ISE.exe, it's probably a good indication that someone's trying to inject and use PowerShell um, in your environment to actively go and use it. Detecting specific commands. Now, we try to flag off of things like encoded command and things like that. That's not a very reliable method. Like, we go into customers all the time, and they have like carbon black, and they have these things called watch lists. Like, oh, we're going to look for dash e, dash ec, dash en, dash enco, encoded command. Did you know you, it's possible to, to use encoded command without ever calling encoded command ever? So here's a recent version of Unicorn that I just updated recently. And here's using um, uh, to string, and this never calls encoded command ever, and it reassembles encoded command after it's executed. So you never call encoded command, and you get full execution rights. It's all um, uh, randomized uh, variable names and everything else, so it doesn't get, get picked up by any antivirus. And it also chunks the commands up, so the PowerShell commands are chunked up. So if you take one string, it's not base64 encoded, but you uh, uh, add everything else, um, it works perfectly fine. So a way of getting around most of the detection capabilities just by using to string. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, uh, Daniel um, has uh, invoke obfuscation which totally mangles the code, which you're never going to see. You need to be looking more at the length size um, and behavior around PowerShell than anything else. Uh, a good example of PowerShell is recently John, John, Strand did a, uh, John Strand's company, um, Bo, who's, uh, I love John and Bo and all those guys are amazing folks. Um, they did a, uh, a, a part one of five series, I think, of, of Silence. Um, and so obviously a lot of claims being made around artificial intelligence and machine learning. We are nowhere near artificial intelligence and machine learning in this industry, by the way. Um, but one thing that was interesting is, is Silence would flag on if you ever ran PowerShell.exe. So what do you do? Just rename PowerShell.exe to whatever you want to, and it no longer detected it. So simple things to get around um, a lot of these um, uh, technologies out there based off of that and not off of behavior. If you're not familiar with Sysmon, 
Um, Sysmon is absolutely amazing and it's free. So Sysmon is, is a Microsoft product, it's an MSI you install, and it um, opens up what's called ETW or event log tracing. Um, and it exposes a lot of things like process injection, um, a lot of memory things that are happening out there. And you can put these in and use like Windows event forwarding or move them into your SIM. And there's so many things that you can detect with just ETW, and it's a real small footprint in your environment, but you can detect things like Mimikatz. A uh, good example, Mimikatz calls um, vaultcly.dll, um, and if you see that happening from a non-Windows process, it's probably a good indication that, that you have Mimikatz in your environment. Or why is PowerShell calling vaultcly.dll? That should never happen in any way, shape, or form. So patterns of behavior you can do, but you can find everything from like process injection. If I'm injecting my memory space into another memory space, Sysmon sees all that. So those are great things that you can look for um, and get indicators off of just based off of free stuff that's out there. But regardless, though I just went through a lot of information, right? And I'm, oh, by the way, I post the slides up. Um, but regardless of what we talk about, this stuff takes hard work. It requires us actually understanding what our environment is first, having good configuration management, good you know, patch management, things that we all talk about as the foundation of the security principles, which we should be doing, and focusing on making application whitelisting a priority and then looking for deviations of patterns in there. And the truth of the matter is it is hard work. Um, it, it takes a lot of effort, but it's something that once you get to a maintainable state, it is manageable. It is something that you can actively go and use, and it reduces our risk substantially for technology you probably already have in your company today. It doesn't require purchasing a new piece of technology or going to something next generation. It allows you to use what you have in your existing tool sets to be able to leverage what we see a lot of these, these, these specific attacks happening. What the equation group did is no different. They use lateral movement. You should be able to detect that. Even if they use some crazy awesome zero that no one's ever seen before using SMB version one, it's all in memory. As soon as they move to different systems, you should spot them. You know, one person being compromised is, is irrelevant compared to the mass organization or company being compromised, but it requires us to do an understanding around what our environment is first in order to do it. Last but not least. <laughs> oh, what, what? No, just joking, fair, fair play, but uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who puts on B-Sides, everybody that made this possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>